What is up, Call of Duty fans? I am excited to be bringing you a CWL New Orleans Hardpoint preview, as well as a recap of CWL Dallas Hardpoint. Now, first and foremost, ignore the format mistakes and format grudges that you may have with this PowerPoint presentation that I put together. I assure you, if you stick through it, we've got a lot of content to cover. And there's plenty of uh, juicy statistics in here that you're going to want to know about heading into CWL New Orleans. So this is specifically for a hard point. If I do have the time and energy, I'll make a search and destroy as well as a capture the flag uh, video as well. That also depends on the feedback I get. First, we're going to be covering specific teams, and then we're going to dive into specific players. First, we're going to jump into a map analysis of Arden Forest. See who are the best teams at Arden Forest going into this event. Number one is actually going to be E United. They didn't play Arden Forest at Dallas, which meant they were banning it a lot. They avoided Forest a lot at Dallas. But then at Northern Arena, they beat FaZe in a close matchup, and they took down Luminosity 250-201. to And Luminosity was undefeated until they lost to United. So E United, you got to keep an eye on them because they sort of figured out Arden Forest, and we'll see if they stay playing well on that map or if they're going to fall off. Now, tied for second place is Luminosity. Luminosity uh, opened up Dallas so dominant on this map. 100-point club ground zero. 100-point club Vitality, 100-point club Allegiance. Then, uh, at Northern Arena, they got a close win over Next Threat, they got a close win over Envious, and then they had that lost United. So they were 5-0 and on uh, Arden Forest before that loss to United, and they're one of the top-class hardpoint teams to begin with. Uh, we'll see if they stay hot on Forest. Definitely, if I'm playing Luminosity, this is a map I want to ban. Now, the other honorable mention that's actually tied with Luminosity, according to the ESTAT algorithm, is Splice. They got a win over Ghost Gaming and a win over FaZe. They 100-point club Optic on this map. They took out FaZe again. They beat Optic again. And they took out TK in a close matchup. They have all these impressive wins on Forest. They do have a couple losses. They had an early loss to Evil Geniuses. And they had a tight loss to Echo Fox. So they do have two losses on this map. But they also have numerous impressive wins. They beat some really talented teams on this map. And they're one of those squads that they know how to play Forest. And I would ban it if I was playing against Splice. Moving right along to St. Marie. Which is the second most common hardpoint map after Forest. Uh, number one is going to be Optic, because they're holding a clean 4-0 and on this map. They beat E6, they beat Unilad, they barely beat Envy, and they got a win over Red Reserve. So they've only played it four times, but 4-0 and is pretty good. Uh, so we'll see if they have their first loss at New Orleans. But St. Marie's a map that Optic knows how to play pretty well. E United is also incredibly good on St. Marie. They have they had 100 point clubbed Evil Geniuses. They 100 point clubbed Ghost Gaming. They got a big win over Luminosity. They were able to take out TK. They beat FaZe. They beat Enigma 6. They beat FaZe again. And their only loss on St. Marie is they did have another loss to Splice. So they're 1-1 one one against Splice on this map. But they have a lot of wins. They're the team that I would watch to see uh, how to play St. Marie. Go find a VOD of them playing. Possibly against TK, maybe LG, maybe FaZe. You'll see uh, this team really knows how to play St. Marie. And this is a map I'd ban against the United. Number three on this is going to be Splice. Uh, they are mostly here because they have credit for beating a United. I mean, that, they're the only team that was able to beat United on this map. So they must be pretty good. They also got a solid win against Ground Zero and a close loss to TK. So they're only 2-1. and one. They haven't played it very much. But that is going to be something to watch uh, as well to see if they play St. Marie more often at New Orleans because they seem pretty good at it or if they're going to continue having it banned. Moving right along to the third most common hardpoint map is London Docks. We've got two teams tied for first place here. Luminosity, they got a 100-point club on Epsilon. They got a 100-point club on E United. And they got a 100-point club on Enigma 6, all the E teams. Then they beat E United again, 250 to 120. And they would be 4-0 on this map, but they do have an interesting loss to Echo Fox. So they aren't undefeated, but they've proven that they know how to play London Docks really well. Optic as well. They've only played London Docks three times, but they got a great win over Unilad. They took down Splice, which is a really good team, and they had a really tight loss to Red Reserve. 
two and one isn't exactly a record to say that Optic is the best London Docks team, but they get so much respect for being a really good hardpoint team in general that we just assume that they're really talented on London Docks until they prove otherwise. So another one of Optic's best maps is London Docks, but with other teams probably banning St. Marie against them, I expect to see Optic play London Docks a lot more often. Uh, in third place here with a tie is uh, Splice. They have a 4-3 and three record. They actually started 2-3, and three, but they started climbing the ranks because they had a nice wins over Echo Fox and FaZe Clan at the end of Dallas. So they're a team that might have figured out how to play London Docks. We're going to have to keep an eye on them because they're 4-3, and three, but they're a lot better than that record looks. The other team down there is Red Reserve. Now, Red Reserve is 4-0 and oh on London Docks. If you're going to pick a VOD to watch to see how a team plays London Docks, LG and Red Reserve are great candidates, and I'm really excited to see if they match up as well uh, at New Orleans. Red Reserve had a 100-point club of Mind Freak. They took out Rise, they took out Next Threat, and they had that big win over Optics. So they have yet to lose on London Docks on LAN. So that is something huge to watch to see if they can continue to keep that undefeated streak going or if they're going to go to crawl back to being sort of an average team on London Docks. Next map is Gibraltar. Now, not a lot of teams wanted to play Gibraltar. Northern Arena had actually saw a little bit more usage than Dallas, and I think teams are going to pull it out as sort of a wild card, and we're going to see it more often at New Orleans. But Gibraltar is a map where there's a really small sample size. Now, the two teams that have played really well in Gibraltar is United is actually 2-2. Two and two. They've had a really good win over FaZe and they had a really close win over LG. They also lost to TK and they also lost to LG, but 2-2 two and two is a pretty solid record on Gibraltar and they're a team that's played it four times, which is a lot of experience and they're tied with LG. LG avoided Gibraltar all of Dallas, but then at Northern Arena, they ended up playing it three times. They beat Next Threat, they beat United, and then they had that close loss to United. So between United and LG, they're one and one against each other. They're the two teams that look really dominant on Gibraltar, and we'll see if they uh, want to ban Gibraltar at New Orleans or if they're going to start playing that map more often. The thing about Gibraltar is for these really great hardpoint teams, because of the spawns, it feels a lot more random. It feels a lot more uh, random. It feels like it's the map for an underdog where these dominant slay heavy teams would rather play all the other maps. And Gibraltar's a map that maybe Echo Fox would pull out if they're trying to get some sort of a sneaky win. But surprisingly, United and LG have shown that they can play these maps really well. So we'll see if this map comes up more often. I expect to see it more often at New Orleans. Also, we got to mention number three down there, Team Caliber. The winners of CWL Dallas, they played this map twice at Dallas, they took down Echo Fox, and they took down the United. So they have two solid wins on Gibraltar, and they also look pretty solid. So it seems like the best hardpoint teams here, I mean, Optic hasn't played Gibraltar at all, but United, LG, TK, all these big-time uh, hardpoint squads, they know how to play Gibraltar pretty well. So this is a map that uh, we'll see if they will pull it out against each other. I got a feeling that if Gibraltar comes up, it's going to be a smaller team trying to punch up, necessarily. A uh, smaller team trying to go for a sneaky win. Now we're going to look at overall hardpoint rankings. These are the top 20 teams at hardpoint overall heading into CWL New Orleans. Now, they're kind of going to be grouped into tiers here. you got that upper crust, that top four. Optic, LG, E United, Splice. These four teams have been dominant in hardpoint. And these four teams, I just, against everyone else on here, I expect them to take the hard point. TK slides into that five spot because they defeated Splice in a game five to win Dallas. But I remember that they lost one and maybe both of the hard points in that series. So TK is good at the other game modes, but at hard point, they sort of lead that second tier. They're good, but not as good as that upper crust. Echo Fox and FaZe are right behind them. Really solid hard point teams. Echo Fox is kind of surprising. And these have been calibrated for new rosters. So I'm sort of guessing when it comes to how new rosters are going to be, but I'm using the data from Dallas and Northern Arena as well to make these guesses. So Echo Fox and FaZe are looking like solid hard point teams. Lightning Panda only played two hard points at Dallas. He went one and one but they were impressive enough that we think they're an average hardpoint team. Now, in that average category along with them is Unilad, pretty average. Red Reserve, as we've shown, they're really good at 
London docks, but the other maps not so much. Envious, good at some maps, other maps not so much. Rise Nation, that new team, we're going to see if they can perform, but so far they don't look like a powerhouse hardpoint team either. Now we're going to break into sort of that lower tier. These are teams that are need improvement. If they're trying to get a top 8 placing or a top 6 placing, hardpoint is going to be one place where they definitely need to look better. Evil Geniuses, they're going to be fighting through that open bracket. Uh, we're going to need to see a lot better hard point from them, especially with the veterans on that team. I mean, you'd think they'd play that better. Ground Zero, we got a new roster from Ground Zero. They got a lot of S&D stars, but I don't know about the slaying. We're going to talk about that later. Ground Zero is going to need a lot of slaying. Doom Clan also uh, got a bunch of S&D stars on there. Big question mark on the slaying. Same with Enigma 6. I mean, these are teams that they got some nice players... And I think they're going to be able to win some series, win some maps, but hard point, they just don't stack up that well against these upper top 10 teams that we mentioned. And getting into that bottom crust, Team Vitality did not look good at hard point. Mind Freak, even though they had that nice loser's bracket run that got them a decent placing, uh, they did not look good at hard point. They only got a few lucky wins. Allegiance, formerly known as Allegiance, they are now GGEA Orange, which is just a mouthful of a name. Also had a really rough time playing hardpoint. Epsilon. Epsilon's a really well-respected European team. Got some players that we're familiar with. Three out of those four players, after all. I mean, they were finishing top three at Anaheim. So these are some really good players, but they had a rough time with Dallas playing hardpoint. We're going to see if they can improve as well. Now we're going to introduce a new statistic, sort of a new concept that I want you to get on board with. Uh, it's called teamwork points. Now, in a hardpoint matchup, one team will have better slaying. They'll have more kills than deaths. And obviously, the team that slays more often is going to win more often. I think the actual number is around 81-82% of the teams that outslay are also able to get the win. So it's obvious that the slaying margin and the win margin are proportional. If you outslay the other team by 40 kills, you probably 100 point clubbed them. If you outslay the team by one kill, it's probably a close matchup. There's like a nice linear proportional association between those two. For every extra kill on slaying margin, it's about four and a half points of winning in a hard point. Now, the thing is that it's not predictable always right sometimes it'll be on the dot and it'll be you know x team slays by this much and they win by this much and it all makes sense but there's a lot of room for unpredictability so teams are always over or underperforming what their slang says they should do there's a lot of cases where a team will slay really heavy but they'll only win by a little bit so they underperformed and some teams are just wild, they'll have over, they'll have underperforming, but when you average it out, it's all the same. But we're going to pay attention to some teams that are consistently underperforming their own slang, or consistently overperforming their own slang. That's sort of invisible points. Teams can be really good at getting these teamwork points, or these invisible points, where out on top of their slang, they're able to gain some points for their squad. So before we look at specifically which teams are really good or bad at these invisible points, uh, we kind of have to wonder, how can a team be good at this? One, teamwork, communication, callouts, getting really good trades, that helps. Rotations, you know, getting full 60s rather than getting scrap time, that's a big deal. And probably just teamwork in general, you know, the strategies, you know, knowing when to rotate, knowing... Uh, the right callouts. It's sort of like these invisible points, I think, is the way that we can see in Call of Duty what teams play hardpoint the smartest. Not just which teams have the best gun skill, which teams can outslay, and which teams have all these really talented players, but which teams are also playing hardpoint the smartest. That's the way this teamwork points, invisible points, this new statistic, that's sort of the way we can start to guess which teams have the best strategy you know it's not absolute but it's interesting to think about and it's interesting to look at how teams play differently you know the teams at the top and the bottom first we're going to look at the three most absurd matchups from dallas where slaying and score really don't match up at all right here on top i'm going to get optic gaming played against enigma six early in the tournament they won 250 to 218 now what's remarkable is scump led the way on optic and went even 31 and 31 Krim, Karma, Formal, they all went pretty negative. 
And then you go look at Enigma 6. Dashy was going off. General was positive. Decimate was positive. And Bevel's not so much. But Enigma 6 outslayed by a lot. I think it was 10 kills. Even more than 10 kills. It was like 20? I mean, that was absurd, the fact that Optic was able to win. And I remember what's interesting is Optic, I think it was Crim6, tweeted before the tournament, before Dallas even started, and said, only against Enigma 6 can we all go negative and still win by 100 points, or something like that. He had just finished a scrim that was really crazy, and he was pointing out that Enigma 6 is a really weird team where they can have huge slaying margins and then for some reason totally underperform on the scoring. So that's the one example. Down here in the bottom left is an interesting one. Luminosity smoked Epsilon 250 to 93, a total clean win. But JCap was negative, John was negative, Slack and Octane were both positive, but overall I think they only had 6 or 8 on the slaying margin. So their slaying margin was good for them. It looked like they were going to win. But they weren't blowing Epsilon out. I mean, that they 100-point clubbed Epsilon, yet, as you can see, the slaying numbers uh, weren't that lopsided. So that was an interesting situation where it didn't really change who won in the end, but Luminosity only outslayed by a little, and yet they won by a whole lot. So I think that was just really good rotations and really solid teamwork. I think they were just clicking that map. Now, the one in the bottom right is the one where it was mind-blowing as well because of how Team Envious can choke maps with slaying margin. So next threat takes out Team Envious 250 to 221. Classic goes huge for Envious. Slasher goes plus 7 for Envious. Temp and Huke sort of balance out. Temp is plus 2. Huke is minus 2. Hook. Hook is minus 2. Mispronounce that. Classic and Slasher slay so heavily, they give Team Envious a 20 slaying margin. Plus 20. Next threat goes negative 20. I mean, look at Ricky, 13 and 31. That is horrendous. Team Envious outslays next threat by 20 kills, and yet next threat gets a win, and it wasn't even super close. It was 250 to 220. They even had a 30-point buffer. So that those are the three most crazy situations where slang margin and the actual score just are way off. And now we're going to really dive into the teams that are the best and the worst at this whole teamwork chemistry ratings. I'm going to call them teamwork points, but I also like to call them invisible points because it's the points that you can't attribute to slaying. So of course, the best teamwork points goes to Luminosity Gaming. They averaged 53 teamwork points per map. That means that regardless of how the slaying goes, on average, Luminosity would hypothetically start a hardpoint matchup up 53 to 0. They gave themselves a 53 point edge just because their strategy, their callouts, their teamwork, their rotations, their chemistry, whatever you want to call it, Luminosity dominated on this invisible points. Seven of their nine maps, they had at least 30 invisible points. They never went negative. Luminosity is the most fundamentally sound hardpoint team there is. They proved it at Northern Arena. They showed a little bit of it at Dallas. Hardpoint is definitely Luminosity's best game mode. And not only do they have really good slaying, but they just have incredible teamwork. Underneath them is a bit of a surprise. Red Reserve had 35 teamwork points per map. And they had an extremely high correlation, 0.986. That means that roughly 99% of their slaying to winning margin correlations, pretty much what you could call it, uh, can be predicted. And it meant that they were very consistent. So Red Reserve was super, super consistent at getting 35 teamwork points per map. So Red Reserve was one of the most consistent and uh, fundamentally sound hardpoint teams at Dallas, which would surprise some people, you know, uh, partly because they're EU, they're not even the best EU team, they didn't really splash, you know, at Dallas and get a really high placing, but outside of their slang, which was meh, they were getting a really good boost from having really smart strategies and rotations on these hardpoint maps. Now we get into Splice. Splice was about 21 per map. They had a weaker correlation, though, so it's like... In the end, Splice sort of averaged out on the positive side of 21 per map, 
but they also had some negative performances. So Splice was a team where it's a really small sample size, but they gave an indication that they can play really smart hardpoint at times. Same with Team Caliber. They averaged 18, and they had a really low correlation. So in the end, they had some really high, some really low values. There were some times where they had lost a lot of invisible points, sometimes where they won a whole lot of invisible points. So that was a really low correlation, but Team Caliber is another team where on the small sample size, it looks like they are really good at this whole teamwork chemistry thing on hardpoint. Looking at the worst ratings, Rise Nation, I um makes it makes me kind of glad they split up almost because this team was really terrible. With a really high correlation, they lost 42 teamwork points on average. So they were practically down 42 to zero at the start of hard points just off of the rotations, callouts, strategies. Rise Nation was having some serious trouble on a hard point. Uh, they were losing a lot of those points and consistently. So maybe the team didn't want to play with each other. Maybe they didn't practice as much as they should. Something was off about their hard point. Team Envious, right underneath them, minus 39 on average. Five different times they outslayed and lost. I think they played either 9, 10, or 11 hard points total. Five different hard points. It's like I'm laughing just thinking about it. They had a positive slaying margin, and then they lost in the end. They have a crazy low correlation, too. They're extremely inconsistent. Team Envious is the number one team out of all the teams uh, at Dallas where their slaying margin gave, like, no prediction at all. If you looked at the scoreboard of Team Envious... There was no way you could tell whether they actually won or lost based on the scoreboard. It was something crazy, something different every time. They were totally unpredictable. And then they averaged out to be negative. Most of the time, they were going hard on the negative side, but they also had some crazy positive performances too. In general, it was insane. Team Envious, uh, they need to they need to fix something about their hard point. I'd have to watch some VODs to really figure out what they're doing wrong. Ghost Gaming? Uh, they're a really small sample size. They only played six hard points. They lost all six, and they got outslayed in every map. So I don't really know what's going on, but they lost 24 teamwork points on average. That's probably just because once they start getting outslayed, they tilt a little bit. They get a little bit panicky. Ghost Gaming was off all weekend. That's the deal with them. FaZe, Mind Freak, Enigma 6, Epsilon, and Allegiance. All five of those teams together uh, didn't look that solid on hard point. They averaged about ni negative 19 teamwork points. They sort of get an honorable mention here at the bottom uh, for all of them being a little bit bad, but none of them really standing out. Now we're going to get into team composition, which was really interesting to look at. So I put players into three categories. There's main ARs, guys that play ARs uh, sev more than 70% of the time. There's main subs, people that played the PPSH more than 70% of the time. Then there's hybrids. Hybrids are people that switch between AR and sub uh, at least 30%. Whatever gun they use less often, they use it at least 30%. Or in some cases, I made an exception where it was obvious that they used an AR or a sub specifically on one map. Where for some players, it was like they're pulling out a sub on St. Marie, but they're pulling out an FG on all the other hardpoint maps. Those players got classified as hybrid because their team relied on them to play both guns depending on what the map was. So we're going to look at team compositions. Out of the 20 Dallas teams that we have complete data for, we're going to look at what their team actually looked like. Uh, starting with Mind Freak. Mind Freak is the only team that had two AR players, a hybrid, and a sub. So they had two players, I think this was Denz and Buzzo, that were consistently ARs, and then they had a third hybrid, which made me think, if they have a third guy that was sometimes playing AR, does that mean they ran three ARs on a map? And Mind Freak, sometimes on Forest and sometimes on London Docks, they pulled out three FGs and a PPSH. So because some maps, uh, sometimes on Forest, sometimes on Docks, they had three FGs and a PPSH, that's why they have two ARs, one hybrid, one sub. Now, a really common team comp was just two ARs, two subs. No mixing. Two, two team ARs, two team subs... The line drawn right down the middle, no hybrids. Echo Fox, ALG, Splice, Rise, Team Caliber, Enigma 6, Optic, all these teams followed this pattern. Now, then there was another interesting category down here with one AR, two hybrids, and a sub, which belongs to four teams that fall in this category. Uh, they only had one main AR and one main sub, and the other two players were doing some funky stuff. 
Now, Ghost Gaming. Mox was their main AR, and Lacefield and Llama, one of them was always running the FG with Mox. But which one it was, they couldn't really agree on. It seemed like it went back and forth. So Lacefield and Llama, uh, one of them was running the FG with Mox, but it wasn't a guaranteed which one. Same thing with Next Threat. Ricky was the main AR, and between Methods and Nagafin, they sort of switched off who was going to play the FG with Ricky. Uh, it wasn't consistent. One of them was playing the FG, so both of them get classified as hybrids because they both played a little bit of FG, a little bit of PPSH. Vitality was really interesting. Whalers was the one main AR, and on Arden Forest, they used two FGs, and Malls used a bar. Malls was one of two players that used a bar at CWL Dallas. It was all FG and PPSH, but there was two situations where we saw the bar get pulled out. There were two players that used it, and Vitality was one of them. On Arden Forest, they would pull out the double FG setup, and Malls would play the bar. Now, if you think that's interesting, just wait and see Epsilon. Epsilon falls into the same category. Nathan, also known as Insanitized, played their main AR, and on Forest, they pulled out three FGs and a bar. I checked this. I think this is in two separate situations. This is something you might want to go back and watch to see if you can. On Arden Forest, this team played three FGs, and then I think it was Vortex that pulled out the bar. Vortex joined, Ma joined Malls as the only other player that wanted to pull out a bar. And then on some maps, Epsilon would play three subs. You know, I think maybe St. Marie, for example. Nathan was the AR. They had three subs. So Epsilon was the most fluid team, where they went from four ARs to one AR, depending on the map. They were the team that had the most consistency. It didn't seem like it helped them too much, but that was an interesting thing to point out now another super common setup was one ar one hybrid two subs basically these are teams that got their two main subs they got their one solid ar and then they have one guy that sort of flips back and forth because sometimes you want triple subs on a map and sometimes you want that two two split so they'd have that one guy that was in charge of uh going back and forth between whether they wanted the one three or the two two split so this is a super common composition as well phase clan eg united red reserve luminosity envy and unilad all use the setup and now the only other twist was one ar three subs that was actually ground zero ground zero consistently had parasite as the ar and ferocities blastful and study all with subs. It took me a while to remember study. St they almost always ran subs. So the Ground Zero was sort of an outlier team where they wanted to have one AR all the time, and the other three were always running subs with only a few exceptions. So that's interesting. Now we're going to look at the top hardpoint KDs from Dallas. But the interesting thing is ARs, people playing the FG at Dallas had a 1.1 KD, people playing the PPSH had a 0 0.9. ARs were wildly out of balance, and that's something that the meta totally got shaken up uh, before NOLA. So at New Orleans, there's going to be a different meta. When we look at the stats for Dallas, we have to separate these pools, these groups of players, into AR hybrid sub. We have to be able to look at these groups differently because subs had so much of a harder time. For example, there was only three subs that had a KD above 1.1 in hardpoint, but I think there was like 10 or more ARs. So now we're going to take a look at top hardpoint KDs in Dallas. AR, Octane, actually leads the way with a crazy 1.35 hardpoint KD. Right behind him, Slasher, Consistent, 1.3. He had a great Dallas. Dashy, also had an exceptional Dallas, had a 1.28 Formal had a 1.28, and Mox, despite Ghost Gaming going 0-6 in hardpoint, had a great 1.22 hardpoint KD. Those are the big-time ARs. Hybrid players, guys that used a little bit of a sub, a little bit of an FG. Silly had a great 1.16. Wuskin was playing great, had a 1.15. Methods, Methods kind of shined this tournament. Uh, he had a 1.14, and Zero had a 1.12. Now, the only three subs that we saw... Uh, with above a 1.1 KD, Temp. Temp was an animal. He had a 1.18. He stood out apart from everyone else as the one PPSH player that was really flying. So Temp is someone to watch right now. Go watch VODs of whatever Temp was doing at Dallas. That's how you should be playing the PPSH, I guess. Because he was having a great time. Then again, Envy was tricky because they had a pretty poor hardpoint record. John sneaks in right behind him as the LG sub with a 1.12, and 
And then after that, EG represented here with Apathy. I know Apathy had a, some offers to go to some other teams during Roster Mania. He sticks up, he sticks together with EG, but he had a 1.11. He had a really solid hard point KD at Dallas as well. Now we're going to look at the trash can KDs at Dallas. The players that really had some ugly, ugly KDs. Uh, AR. There was only two ARs because being an FG was so easy. There was only two main ARs that had really poor KDs. TJ Holly, uh, 0.88. Really disappointing from him. And Buzzo of Mind Freak with an ugly 0.85. Despite being the FG player, he had a terrible KD. Now the hybrid players with the bad KDs. Nagafin had a .89. Not a great tournament for him. Llama and Lacefield, both on the same team. Llama goes .77 and Lacefield goes .76. It's rough. And then the subs. Josh had a .83. Not a good tournament. Moose, not looking too good with a .81. Mayhem, also pretty ugly, .77. Sensor, down there with a .75 hardpoint KD. And Spacely, oh my goodness, look away, hide your kids. A .69 Dallas hardpoint KD, and I don't think it gets that much better in the other game modes. It was a disaster of an event for Spacely, as well as Lacefield and Llama God, for that matter. Now we're going to look at uh, certified objective players. Uh, if you look at Hill Time, these are all the players that had close to 30% of their team's total hill time. So there's four players, so you'd expect each of them to have 25% hill time. And what's interesting is all it takes is to have 30%, and you're considered an OBJ player. Now, I know there's other metrics like hill defense or hill captures, and in the future for New Orleans, I might be looking into the ways to incorporate that into giving each player an objective rating, how busy they are revolving the objective. But right now, we're just going to look at hill time. We're going to look at the top hill time percentage performances, the players that did the most hill time on their team uh, and deserve credit for that. So these players, regardless of if they had a bad KD or a good KD, these are certified objective players. They spent a lot of time in the hill. Spacely, despite having such a horrendous KD, 37% of his team's hill time. Now granted, Ghost Gaming did not play well in hardpoint, so they did not have a lot of total hill time anyway as a team. And it's interesting to think about. Did Spacely have a low KD because he kept trying to push the hill, kept trying to be a team player? Or did he end up sitting in hill because he knew he was playing terrible, and maybe it's a mix of the two. That's something I find interesting. Malls had 33.7% hill time percentage. Was very impressive for him, holding it up for team vitality there. Spoof from Allegiance had a 31.8%. Accuracy, I believe he was your tournament MVP, had a 31.7% hill time percentage. And a positive KD, that's really impressive for him. TJ Holly, one of the more disappointing ARs, he was in the hill a lot, so he does have that going for him, 31.7%. Per percent. <laughs> Zero, also big on the KD, 1.12, 31%. Zero was super busy, he was a super underrated player from Dallas. Sensor had a really rough KD, but as we know, Doug does. My man Dougie, 31% in the hill. Staying busy on that objective. Still that team captain there. Classic also uh, from Envious had 30%. He's a certified objective player. Moving on to this page two, we got a few more here for you. Blastful, surprisingly, the S&D star from Ground Zero, 30%. Scump also 30%. Really impressive. Optic Gaming was doing a lot of... Uh, winning in Hardpoint. And Scump, maybe it's because he was having a rough tournament, but he was... Sitting in hill, racking up that hill time. Lacefield, also from Ghost Gaming, 30%. Pristini, 30% from E United. He was the guy sitting in hill for E United when they were dominating. Ferocities, right there. Blastful's counterpart, sitting at 29.7%. Really nice. Nathan, uh, main AR, had 29.6%. And Slasher. Slasher, the fact that he was in the hill that much, along with that incredible 1.3 KD, Slasher was seriously... Uh, an MVP for Envious at Dallas. Now we're going to 
Now that we looked at these certified OBJ players, I'm going to introduce another interesting stat. I did look at this last year during Infinite Warfare, and I'm bringing it back. It's called the carry and the cost. Now, every player's plus minus is pretty straightforward. It's their kills minus their deaths. I think it's a better stat than KD. I think plus minus is a better representation of the player's performance. And it's pretty straightforward, too. If your plus minus is five or more better than the next best teammate, it doesn't matter if you win or lose. It doesn't matter how well you actually did. As long as that next teammate is a whole five points underneath you, you get a carry because you're so much better than the rest of your team on that scoreboard. That's a carry. Same thing for a cost. If you're way underneath the rest of your team, so you perform significantly worse, five or more, you're going to get a cost. Now, in some situations, because these scoreboards are super different, super variable, I had to invent something called a half carry and a half cost. So there's sometimes where a player gets a carry. They qualify for a carry because two teammates are way below him. But then there's another teammate that was way, way better than him. So you can't quite say that this person carried because there might be a the person right above them, the player right above them did so much better that I can't really give him credit for a full carry because... It just doesn't make sense, but I can't really take that away from them because they performed way better than the other two teammates below, and they had a really good showing. So I sort of invented the half carry and the half cost. That's something we don't really need to get into too much. Only a few players uh, it affected. I think there was only one player in the entire 80-player pool that had more than one half carry, half cost. So that's something that sort of tweaked my percentages a little bit, and I had to invent it. But you don't really need to rack your brain thinking about it. So, now we have carry and cost, we can look at something called carry percentage and cost percentage, which is straightforward. It's the amount, percentage of hard points where a player finished with a carry and or a cost. So we're going to look at that and we're going to make some cool leaderboards off of all the players of CWL Dallas using this statistic. So this leaderboard is called King Backpackers, and Backpackers is obviously for carries. So this is just sorted by carry percentage. As you'll notice, there's a lot of ARs that pop up, starting with Mox, who had a 100% carry percentage. In Mox carried Ghost every single hard point. I know it's hard to believe. We're gonna, I'm gonna show you proof later. My man Mox was exceptional. That number over there, the 5.0 plus minus. That's just this average plus minus. So it's a nice little metric that shows you overall how well he did uh, for his team in terms of slaying uh, outside of the, just the carry cost percentage. Dashy as an AR also was going huge for Enigma 6. 60% carry percentage and a 6.9 plus minus. Zero is a hybrid. He even played the sub sometimes, had a nice 60% carry percentage. Octane, our big time... AR Slayer, 56% carry percentage, 11% cost, and a whopping 7.2 average plus minus. He was huge for LG. Slasher was also busy. 6.3 plus minus, 46% carry percentage. Slasher was on point. Formal for Optic, he was the big AR for them. 46% carry, 8% cost. Formal was doing great. Dens, surprisingly sneaking in there. Dens of Mind Freak was doing a lot of carrying. 46%, as well as the 8% cost. Rated big time AR for Red Reserve uh, was a bit of a wild card. He had 45% carries, 20% costs, so he was either at the top or the bottom of the leaderboard a lot. The list continues. Aqua as an AR for Rise Nation was really good, 43% carry. Methods as a hybrid. Now, there was more ARs that qualified, but I'm just going to dive into hybrids and subs because we got to give them some props too. Methods as a hybrid had a 41% carry. He had an outstanding tournament. He really, uh, his stock probably went up more than any other player. He was great. Temp is a big time sub. Had a 38% carry and an 8% cost. He was really good. Wuskin out there as a hybrid also was really solid. 36% carry, 18% cost. And then a couple more subs that I got to give shout outs to. Looney was really nice for uh, Rise Nation. 36% on the carries. Apathy also had a 33% carry and an 11% cost, which is pretty high for a sub. That's the third highest ranked sub. So 33% is only one out of three games. But for a sub to be carrying his team, 
uh, one out of three games at, at Dallas. That's pretty impressive. So shout out to Apathy out there at Evil Geniuses. Now I'm going to pick out specific uh, either duos of two players or single players, and we're going to look at specifically the games at which they carried, specifically how they influence their team, really dive into the nitpicky details. And we have to start with Mox. My man Mox needs some help, because this fool went dad mode. These are all six of the hard points. Starting with a 250-129 to 129 loss. Mox goes plus 10, 32-22. Rest of his team, negative 18. They get 100 point clubbed. Mox does the best he can. He goes 17-16. and 16. Rest of the team goes negative 33. Jesus. Then they lose by 100 points again. Mox goes plus 3, 25 and 22. He's doing his best. Rest of the team, negative 26. Then they lose by 70 points. Mox goes 28 and 23, plus 5. Rest of the team, negative 15. Just a disaster. The closest they came, they lose by 7 points. Mox goes 33 and 24, plus 9. Rest of the team is a disappointment, minus 10. Then another 100-point club where Mox goes 23 and 21, plus 2. Rest of his team goes negative 29. I mean, it is just mind-blowing to think about. My guy Mox, as the main AR, I still think he's one of the most talented players in Call of Duty. He's one of those guys that deserves a lot more credit. And if I'm building an amateur team, not necessarily an amateur team, but one of those fringe amateur pro teams, he's my number one draft pick. If I can't pick guys from LG or Optic because, you know, they're locked up by contracts, and I'm picking the best of, like, the semi-pro, amateur pro guys, Mox is definitely my number one. This guy is so criminally underrated. He goes positive in all six hard points, yet his team goes 0-6. This guy went into dad mode. He was so good, and I'm going to be seeing if Ghost Gaming can get him some help at CWL New Orleans, because this man needs some help. Now the next sample size we're going to look at is Zero and Rated. They were actually the number one duo in terms of two players on the same team that were doing a whole lot of carrying. They were the number one duo. Let's look at an example. Map 1. This is chronological order. I, I would go into detail, but I don't really have the time. This is already a super long video. So I'm just going to say map one. They got a win. Rated goes 28 and 22, and the rest of the team goes negative 11. So they got a surprising win despite being outslayed. Then look at map two. Uh, they got a loss, but zero goes 16 and 19. The rest of his team goes negative 37. So zero is the only one who was close to average. Map three, they got a win. Rated goes massive, 31 and 10. With a plus 21. The rest of his team wasn't that far behind with a plus 11. But it was definitely a hard carry from Rated. Map 4 they get a win. 0 and Rated go huge. 0 goes 35 and 24. Rated goes 31 and 21. The rest of the team goes negative 14. They definitely won because 0 and Rated put on that hard carry. Map 5. Look at Rated going massive again. 41 and 26. Plus 15. Rest of the team had a minus 10. Rated is the reason they won map 5, and him and Zero were the reason they won map 4. Map 6, I have to point out that Rated was a cost here. The rest of the team went plus 8, Rated went 18 and 26. He's lucky they still got that win. Map 7, they went right back to carrying. This time Zero was huge, 28 and 11. Rated right behind him, 21 and 15. The two teammates, which by the way are Moose and Shawnee, we're going to be talking about them later, went minus 5. Map 8, they got another win. This is incredible, the streak these guys went on hard point. Zero goes 27 and 20 with a plus 7. The rest of the team goes minus 10, which means they got outslayed and still got the win. Zero with the hard carry. Map 9, they got a tough loss, but Zero goes 17 and 19. The rest of the team goes negative 30. Map 10, Zero's doing it again. They lose even though Zero goes 28 and 23. Rest of the team goes negative 20. All of these maps you can clearly see, Rated and Zero are just huge catalysts for this team to do well. In their wins, one of the two is going huge. In their losses, one of the two is playing pretty well while the rest are trash. So there's only a couple in cases where they both went off at the same time, but Red Reserve's hard point success was definitely because Zero and Rated were playing out of their mind. They were an exceptional duo. And I want to see if they keep that up, because for Red Reserve to get another really nice placing, I can't remember if they got top 8 or top 12, but I'm going to say they got top 8. If they want another really nice placing uh, at NOLA. Uh, unfortunately, 
They're going to have to keep playing great like this. Now we're going to look at Dashy, an emerging star. I think him and Methods were the two players that had their stock go up the most at this event. Dashy was doing so much carrying. Look at map one. Rest of the team goes plus one. Dashy goes 43 and 26. Man, this guy drops a 40 bomb in his first hard point on land. Map two. Uh, Dashy only goes negative seven, 16 and 23. I had to point that out. The one time where he didn't play that well because the rest of these times he's going crazy. Map three. Dashy drops another 40 bomb, 41 and 26. The rest of the team goes negative 20. This team goes negative five on slaying margin. They still get the win. Dashy, hard carry. Map four. Dashy goes negative again, 23 and 29. Not that good. Team gets the loss. Map 5, 23. Rest of the team goes negative 8. Like, get this guy some help. And they get the win because of it. Map 6, Dashy goes 38 and 26. He almost drops another 40 bomb. Rest of his team goes negative 3. They get the loss. Map 7, Dashy says, okay, I guess I got to do even better. He goes 36 and 15, plus 21. Rest of the team goes even. They get that win. Map 8, Dashy goes 19 and 19. The team gets the win. Map 9, they get a loss, but Dashy drops a 40 bomb and a loss. This guy goes 40 and 27. The rest of the team gives him no help. They go negative 21. And then map 10, we got to point out, went 23 and 29 with a negative 6. 6 out of 10 maps, 60% of the time, Dashy was going massive for this team. This guy was doing so much carrying for Enigma 6. And he's such a powerful AR. I wonder if it was... Maybe he was playing selfish, maybe that's why he got all these kills, or is it really just that Dashy is one of the next big ARs that we have to keep an eye on, and maybe one of these higher teams above Enigma 6 should be trying to poach Dashy, because he had a great tournament, he did a lot of carrying. Next we're going to look at Octane, the best hardpoint KD, the king assault rifle, the master FG reigns once again. All through of IW, if you're looking who the top AR was, it was like a little bit of Octane, a little bit of Formal, a little bit of Zero at times. But Octane was King AR at Dallas. We're going to look at why. Map 1, 29 and 18 goes huge. Rest of the team goes negative, carries him to the win. Map 3, if you notice I'm skipping Map 2. I'm For the sake of time, we're skipping ones here that are sort of irrelevant. Octane goes 31 and 22, plus 9, rest of the team goes negative, carries him to a win again. Map 4, he had a double carry, a, a duo carry. Octane goes 25 and 11, John also, great, great uh, map, goes 24 and 13, they get the win. Map 5, Octane this time duo carries with J-Cap. He goes plus 10, J-Cap goes 31 and 20, big map 5 win. Octane did cost him in map 7. He went 17 and 26, negative 9, while the rest of the team was only negative 5. So he did cost him on map 7. Came right back to it, map 8. Octane goes 36 and 20, plus 16. Does a duo carry with John, who goes 34 and 20. All of these dominant wins from Octane feature some huge performances. He had plenty of massive performances. And in their wins, he had an average plus minus of 10.86. That's average. And then in their two losses, he actually had an ugly negative 5.5. So the two of their nine hard point losses, Octane was not doing well. But he was going so huge to make up for that in all of their wins. Octane was super important to LG being a dominant hard point team. This guy is King AR. Now, another fun one to look at is going to be Slasher and Temp. Temp is the sub. Slasher is they are. Both of them had amazing KDs, and they look great on paper. Statistically, with these KDs, with these carry cost percentages, these guys are amazing. Yet they had a 4-8 and eight hard point record. They were really bad at hard point. Part of that, as we mentioned earlier, was that inconsistency, those teamwork points, those invisible points. But we're also going to look at this to look at, uh, look at it a little bit deeper as well. Start with map one. Envious gets the win. Slasher goes 39 and 16. That's mind blowing. Temp right behind him, 26 and 16. The other two players, Classic and Hook, negative 12, they get the win. Map two, Slasher's massive again, 41 and 23. Temp goes plus six. Rest of the team's negative 19, carried by Slasher and Temp. Map three, Temp tried his best. He went 27 and 24. The rest of the team was negative. They get the loss. Map four, Slasher has a 
good game, 27 and 18. Classic actually had a nice job with a plus 7. Rest of the team goes negative 14. They can't get the win. Map 6, Slasher goes 33 and 27. He had a plus 6. The rest of the team just went way too negative. He tried to carry him. It didn't work. Map 7, they had a loss. Even though Classic went 34 and 21, Slasher went 25 and 18. The rest of the two players, the other two players went even. So incredible. They had 20 points, but they couldn't get it done. A hard carry from Classic and Slasher didn't work out. Map 8, they actually got a win. And this was on the back of Temp. I mean, look at that. 28 and 7. A freaking 4 KD from Temp. That is one heck of a carry. Map 9, Slasher and Temp tried their best. Slasher went 30 and 20. Temp went 29 and 23. The other two players let him down. They let themselves down on the invisible points. They got a tough loss there. Map 11, Temp goes massive, 29 and 16, 13 positive. The rest of the team went negative 5. They get the loss. So you can see there's a lot of losing here, and Temp and Slasher were doing the best they could, you know? Envious is a really strange team. We're going to have to see if this pattern continues, because it was really weird the way that they would be carrying and having huge stat lines. And then go 4-8 and eight at the same time. But as you can see, there were some incredible performances from Slasher and Temp. Some crazy carries that still resulted in losses. Next, we're going to look at Optic Gaming. A really top, one of the top-notch uh, hardpoint teams. Formal and Crim6. Iconic, legendary assault rifles. They were both going off, playing great with each other. We're going to dive into that. Map 1. Formal goes negative 10. Rest of the team goes negative eight. They still get that win against Enigma 6. So Formal actually dropped a pretty big burger right off the bat, map one. But he bounced back. Map three was classic. Formal, 27 and 14. Crim 6, 25 and 13. Huge double carry for the win. <coughs> map five, Crim 6, 32 and 22 plus 10. He carries him to a win. Map seven, Formal's back at it. A massive 36 and 19 carries him to the win, especially with the rest of the team going negative 11. Formal is the reason they won. Map 8, they get the loss, but Crim 6 goes 33 and 25. Rest of the team goes negative 5. Crim 6 with a carry. Map 10, Crim 6 is back to carrying with a crazy 28 and 10. Plus 18. Map 11, they get the loss. Formal does his best. He goes 30 and 22. The rest of the team goes negative 40. I think they got 100 point clubbed in that one. So Formal, as you can see, trying to carry there. Map 12, Formal's carrying again. 36 and 25 plus 11 carries him to a win. Map 13, they get the loss, even though Formal goes 32 and 26. Karma goes plus 7. The rest of the team was negative 6. Formal is trying his best. Map 14, they lose again. Formal up there at the top of the leaderboard, 35 and 27. The rest of the team negative 19. So early on, it was Crim6 doing some great carrying. And then in the later stages, it was Formal doing the best he could, putting on some carries, even though they weren't winning very many hard points. So Formal and Crim6, big-time performances at Dallas, big-time AR showings. Uh, what's interesting is that sort of uh, one of them was going off, but not both of them at the same time. If both of them go off at the same time, Optic's winning, no doubt. But it's interesting to see how... At the beginning of Dallas, it was Krim, and at near the end, it was Formal, but it wasn't both of them at the same time. Aqua and Looney were both underrated. The Rise Nation star players, uh, they tried their best to do some carrying. We're going to look at that here. Map 1, Aqua goes 35-17. and 17. Rest of the team goes plus 12. They get a nice, easy win. Map 2, look at that. Aqua, 36-24. Looney, 30-24. The other two players, Felony and DJ Ali, let them down, negative 13. They get the loss. Same story in map three. I mean, this is just classic. I mean, it's so obvious here. I mean, Aqua goes 37 and 32. Looney goes 35 and 30. The rest of the team goes negative 15. The other two guys let them down again. Map four, they get a loss. Aqua and Looney combine to go negative three. The other two guys go negative 17. Map seven, Looney goes hard for the win. He goes 40 and 31 with a plus nine. Rest of the team goes negative one. Looney carries him to the win there. And it was just kind of easy to see. You know, Aqua and Looney went, had a positive 5.83 in their wins. And they actually even had a positive two in the losses. They were underrated because Rise Nation wasn't doing so well. They were losing. 
But Aqua and Looney were trying their best, and they were having some really good uh, carry performances, trying their best. Huh? Now we're going to look at Methods and Ricky, the open bracket warriors. Ricky did not get as much praise as he deserved. We're going to look at that. Look at this. Map 1, Methods 38 and 29 plus 9. Ricky 31 and 26. The other two guys, Sensor and Nagafen, go negative 19. Ricky and Methods carry him to the win. Map 2, Methods goes 26 and 18. Nagafen actually went crazy and had a plus 17. They get the win. Map 3, Methods is carrying again, 29 and 25. Ricky tried his best, 32 and 26. The rest of the team, negative 10. They can't get the win. Map 4, they lose. Methods and Ricky combine to go negative 1. The rest of the team, negative 17. Skip all the way to map 7. Ricky's dropping a 40 bomb, 40 and 19. Methods goes 35 and 19. These guys go crazy. The rest of the team went negative 17. That's a hard carry for Methods and Ricky. Map 8, Ricky goes 27 and 23. He's positive. The rest of the team goes negative 16. So that's a tough loss. Map 10, Methods goes crazy. 35 and 23. The rest of the team went negative pretty hard. Down there, negative 32. Methods carried him to the win. They would not have won if it wasn't for Methods. So Ricky and Methods are some underrated players too. They did some really good carrying. They had a plus 6.9 in, in next threats wins. They had a negative 1.08 in the losses. But it was clear that both Ricky and Methods were having some outstanding performances when next threat when next threat was doing well. Scraps and Wuskin, I want to point out. The twins did some hard carries. Let's look at that for Unilad. Map one uh, Scraps and Wuskin went negative 1, the rest of the team goes negative 20 in a loss. Map 3, Wuskin goes 20 and 18, even though the rest of the team went hard on the negative side on the loss. Map 5, Wuskin goes 31 and 28, big carry, rest of the team goes negative 10, he tried his best. Map 6, Wuskin and Scraps went huge, Wuskin goes 36 and 12, 3.0 KD, Scraps is right behind him, 24 and 17, carry to a win. Map 8, Scraps' his turn to carry. He goes 28 and 17 with a plus 11, carries him to a win. Map 9, guess what? Wuskin and Scraps back at it again. Wuskin goes 30 and 16, positive 14. Scraps goes 28 and 19. The other two guys, Shawnee and Moose, go negative. Big wins there for Wuskin and Scraps. Big carry. Map 10, Scraps with the carry. 39 and 27. The rest of the team went negative and 17. Scraps, doing the best he can, got him the win. Map 11 for Unilad. Scraps tried again. He goes 29 and 21, but the rest of the team went negative 20, so it was too much. So Scraps and Wuskin, in those wins, they had a positive 7.17 slang margin. They were playing great, even though they had a negative 1.3 in losses. It's interesting that when Unilad was doing well in hardpoint, it was Scraps and Wuskin going off. One of those two has to go off for them to do well. Something I noticed last year with Fnatic as well. Interesting to see. All right, if you hear any beeping noises, it's because my headset's running out of batteries. We're doing our best to power through this video. Uh, hopefully this headset gets me as far as I need to go. Now we got the burgers. The burgers are obviously going to be the highest cost percentage, the players that were just always lurking at the bottom of the leaderboard. This list is for the burgers in the subcategory. Spacely was horrendous, 67% cost. Mayhem from Allegiance was terrible, 63% cost. Moose had a 9% carry and a 59% cost. Gunless, surprisingly, 4% carry, 58% cost. Sensor, another surprise, 55% cost. And Bevels, Bevels had a 20% carry, but he also had a 40% cost down there for the subs. Now we're going to look at the burgers in the AR and hybrid category. Buzzo, Buzzo was a big burger, 15% carry, 46% cost. Ugly. Nagafin down there for the hybrid had an 18% carry, 45% cost. Llama, they're on the hybrids, 33% cost. Lacefield on the hybrids, 33% cost. Both those guys were not doing too good. Spoof as an AR actually had a 13% carry and a 31% cost. And then TJ Holly, who we mentioned, had a pretty weak KD. is also hanging out down there at a 29% cost, which is not what you want out of, your, out of one of your AR players. Now we're going to do the same thing. We're going to look at some specific groups uh, some specific performances to highlight as well uh, for costing. So we're going to start, we're going to revisit Ghost Gaming. The Ghost Gaming Nightmare. They were some ugly performances from Llama, Lacefield, and especially Spacely. 
Map one, hard point loss. Space League goes 14 and 26 on a fat negative 12. Map two, Space League goes 9 and 25. Ugly. The rest of his team not so, not pretty much as bad as him though. Map three was Llama and Lacefield. The other two players went even. Llama goes 18 and 29. Lacefield goes 24 and 36. You just can't be winning with performances like that. Fast forward to map five. Spacely goes 29 and 34. Llama goes 28 and 34. Those two players cost them. The rest of the team went plus 10. Uh, they almost won that one. Map six. Lacefield goes big negative 14 and 25. Spacely does even worse 16 and 29. Rest of the team goes negative three. Between Spacely, Llama, and Lacefield, they went negative 7.28 plus minus, and that's for each of them. So combined on average, you would expect these three guys to go negative 22. I mean, they just have the worst slaying performance in a hard point. So it's a real small sample size, and it's only up from here. Ghost Gaming seriously hit rock bottom. So the good news is, yeah, it only goes up from here. Now we're going to move over to Mayhem and Spoof. Allegiance did get out of the open bracket. They looked really solid, and they totally bottomed out in pool play. They looked really bad in pool play. I think they went 0-4. They just, nothing was clicking for ALG at Dallas. That attributes mostly to Mayhem and a little bit to Spoof as well. We look at map one. Mayhem goes 20-32. and 32. Rest of the team negative nine. Look at map two. Mayhem goes twenty and twenty nine. The rest of the team is negative two. Fast forward, you got map four. Mayhem goes fourteen and twenty four. Spoof is right next to him at seventeen and twenty seven. The other two players went negative four. Map six, they actually got a win in spite of Mayhem going twenty two and thirty three and Spoof going twenty one and twenty seven. The other two players carried on a plus ten. Map 7, Mayhem is still trash. 16 and 26, negative 10. Rest of the team had a negative 3. Map 8, they lost. This time it was Spoof who went 17 and 25. The rest of the team, rest of the team was only plus 13. So, Spoof uh, with a negative 2.5 plus minus, definitely as an AR was costing ALG, had some ugly performances, and Mayhem especially was the worst performer on Allegiance. Obviously, the roster didn't make any changes, but if you were looking to make changes, Mayhem was the one that was really the bottom of the leaderboard most of the time. He had a really ugly negative 6.25 there on the plus minus. Next, we're going to look at Moose and Shawnee. Now, Rated and Zero were the number one duo, and Red Reserve would have done much better in Hardpoint if it wasn't for Moose and Shawnee having some really questionable performances. These two subs were underwhelming. Moose in map 1, 14 and 25. Shawnee goes 21 and 30. That's going to cost him there. Got to make a quick correction here. Moose and Shawnee, their duo was not rated in zero. That's red reserve. These guys played on Unilad. The duo that was carrying them was Wuskins and Scraps. We saw Wuskins and Scraps play great at Dallas. Uh, Moose and Shawnee were having a lot of negative performances. They were hurting Unilad. Uh, like map three here, Moose 13 and 24, Shawnee 12 and 29. That's horrendous. Uh, map four, Shawnee did play well. He went 33 and 21. Moose not so much. He's negative three. Map five was huge. Moose goes 19 and 29. The rest of the team only goes plus eight. It's clear Moose cost him there. Map six, uh, Scraps and Wuskins went off. They go plus 31. Moose and Shawnee go negative four. Map 7, Moose was, this was a one strange map where Moose and Shawnee both went off. Moose goes 29-18, Shawnee 28-19, and 19, rest of the team plus 4. Moose and Shawnee had a double carry there. Then they go right back to the usuals. Map 8, they get a win. The rest of the team goes plus 20, Moose is 21-23. and 23. Map 9, Moose is 17-23, and 23. Shawnee's 23-27. and 27. The other two players carried with a plus 23. They got carried to the win. Map 10, Moose is 19-29. and 29. The rest of the team's plus five. Somehow they still get the win. Map 11, it's Shawnee now. He goes 19 and 29 for a negative 10. The other two players are negative two. This is interesting to look at because Wuskins and Scraps are going off. And on one hand, you could say that that's just the way the team's designed. That Moose and Shawnee are subs that are going to pick up the objective. They're going to make the smart plays. They're not going to have flashy stats. But as you can see, Unilad was able to do okay in hard point. They were an average hard point team. The team style sort of works. On the other hand, you could also say that Moose and Shawnee both had really bad tournaments and that Wuskins and Scraps need to find themselves better teammates than Moose and Shawnee. So it's sort of a two-way, uh, two ways to look at it. Uh, but it was interesting that Unilad was one team where two players were way better than the other two in terms of stats. Wuskins and Scraps were way ahead of Moose and Shawnee. 
Now we're going to look at Gunless. Question here is what happened? I mean, Gunless had a really ugly tournament uh, playing there with Echo Fox. Map 1, he went 17-29, and 29, negative 12. The rest of the team wasn't that good either, though, negative 12. Map 2, he goes 23-31, negative 8. The rest of the team's minus 5. Go all the way to map 5. The rest of the team's plus 3. Gunless goes 24-36. and 36. They somehow managed to win without him. Map 6, Gunless goes 35-41, and 41, while the rest of the team goes plus 17, and they lose that one. Map 8, Gunless goes 36-43 and 43 for a negative 7, while the rest of the team's negative 1. Map 10, the rest of the team went plus 21, and Gunless goes 32-39. and 39. He's getting carried to these wins. Map 11, Gunless, I gotta give him credit, goes 40-33. and 33. He does drop a 40 bomb. But the rest of the team was doing pretty well, too. Map 12 and another loss. The rest of the team goes negative 12. Gunless goes 26 and 37. So Gunless had a negative 2 plus minus 7.29 in their losses. He had a really ugly tournament. I don't know if Gunless is just going to be a jetpacker or if he's uh, adapting to the new sub meta. I got to watch Gunless at New Orleans because this might be he might completely fall out of the scene or he might prove himself as, you know, at least an average player. But a lot of question marks around him because he had a really bad Dallas in spite of Echo Fox getting a good placing. Now we're going to look at Sensor and Nagafin. This was another case where Ricky and Methods had really strong tournaments and Sensor and Nagafin had some really low KDs. Sleeveless and Thumbless was kind of the best I can come up with here because Next Threat played well. They were the open bracket heroes, but Sensor had a horrible KD. Nagafin had a pretty poor KD. The question is... Are Ricky and Methods better without these two, or was that just the way the team was structured? So we're going to look at map one. Sensor, negative 11, 19 and 30. Nagafin, 19 and 27. The rest of the team carried him to the win. Map two, Nagafin went crazy, 34 and 17. Sensor was bad, 17 and 26. Map three, Sensor goes negative 5, 25 and 30. Nagafin, 17 and 22. Rest of the team, plus 10. Map four, Sensor goes negative 8. Nagafin goes negative 9. Another loss. The rest of the team goes minus 1. Map 5, Nagafin, once again, got to give him some respect for the carry, 36 and 27, while the rest of the team was negative, but they still lost. Map 6, Sensor, 13 and 25, that is ugly, the rest of the team goes minus 10. Map 7, they get a win in spite of Nagafin and Sensor playing terrible. Nagafin goes 20 and 29, Sensor goes 15 and 23, neither of them really helped. Map 8, once again, they get a loss. Sensor and Nagafin are negative 8. The other two players, Ricky and Methods, are plus 1. And then Map 9 again. The rest of the team goes positive 21 in a win, and then Nagafin was kind of quiet, 28 and 31. A lot of situations where Sensor and Nagafin were costing, sitting around at the bottom of the leaderboard, sort of raises questions. And now next threat is an interesting team. All four players are on four different teams, but I'm going to have to watch Nagafin and Sensor to see if they play better on their new teams, if they have a better tournament than at Dallas, because they were poor at Dallas. Now we're going to look at Mind Freak. Mind Freak had uh, some really poor performances from Buzzo and surprisingly Fida as well as Buzzo. Let's dive into that as they were kind of holding Mind Freak back in hard point. Map 1, Fida goes 16 and 33. The rest of the team goes pretty negative as well. Map 2, Buzzo not so much, 15 and 25. The rest of the team was pretty bad too. Map 5, Buzzo and Fida playing terrible. Buzzo 20 and 26, Fida 22 and 32. The rest of the team was positive. That's a definite cost right there. Map 6 again, Buzzo and Fida combined to go negative 16. The rest of the team's only minus 2. Map 7, they get the win, even though Buzzo goes 22 and 28, while the rest of the team goes positive 20. Map 8, got to give some credit to Buzzo. He goes 25 and 23. The rest of the team played terrible. Map 9, Buzzo again, surprisingly, goes 36 and 28, positive 8. But Fida has a bad performance, 26 and 36, negative 10 there. Map 10, Buzzo gets, goes 15 and 19, while the rest of the team goes positive 23 and a win. He got carried. Map 11, this time Fight is going off. He goes 39 and 32 for the plus 7. Buzzo, not so much. 20 and 30. Negative 10 there. Map 13, another loss. Classic. Buzzo, 23 and 28, minus 5. Fight a 31 and 40, minus 9. The rest of the team goes plus 9. There's some situations here where Mind Freak could have done even better than their surprising finish at Dallas if Buzzo and Fight were able to step up and not cost so much. Fight a. You know, he had some good performances. He was a bit of a wild card. He had some carries. He had some costs. Buzzo, on the other hand, for an AR, was the worst AR at Dallas. And it's interesting because, you know, Buzzo is one of those guys that all throughout IW, people are wondering, why didn't he get dropped? Why hasn't he been dropped yet? Can Mind, What can Mind Freak do if they, you know, switched him out for some other talented player? Because there's a few other names that might come up in APAC as someone that Mind Freak wanna, might want to place him with. Yet, he's remained on this Mind Freak roster. And 
he's one of those question marks where it's like statistically he's bad every event. He keeps sinking to the bottom of these KD leaderboards. And is it is it true that he helps Mind Freak in other ways? Does he make up for that bad KD in other departments on that Mind Freak roster? Got to keep an eye on that. See if Buzzo has another bad event now that the ARs have gotten nerfed. Last guy I want to look into is Theory. Now on TK, not a lot of TK players we've talked about yet. Uh, they were sort of good, but not standout. Kenny, Accuracy, Chino. All these guys had really solid stats, but they weren't carrying because this team really gelled. This team was always together, so they didn't, you know, one player wasn't standing out and carrying the other guys. It was them all playing well together, all accumulating those teamwork points. But Theory specifically was interesting. Look at map 2. The rest of the team goes positive 40. Theory goes 15 and 15. Map 5. The rest of the team goes positive 8. Theory goes 24 and 31. Map 7, they get a win. The rest of the team minus 1. Theory goes 26 and 36, so he was costing. Map 11. Theory goes 21 and 34. He almost costs them again as the rest of the team goes positive 6. Map 13. Theory goes 29 and 37 for a negative 8. The rest of the team was minus 9. That map they actually lost. I believe that was in the grand final. So you got to kind of ask yourself. I remember last year, Gosu Crew was Pristini, Arsides, Silly, and Drama. And they were making some noise as Gosu Crew. Uh, they were doing well in pool play. They were open bracket warriors. Uh, this was in the early part of the year, and I was starting to keep an eye on them, but then they made that one switch. They dropped drama, they pick up gunless, boom, they become a tournament champion at CW Atlanta. And a lot of times, you might have a team that breaks onto the scene out of nowhere, and even though the team is really good, they're one change away from being even better than that. And it's really weird to criticize the team that won a tournament, but I have to keep an eye on Theory. Even when they interviewed Theory sometimes, he was joking. He said, man, all my, my teammates are just totally carrying me this whole tournament. There's like a soundbite somewhere where he's like, I'm not doing anything. I'm just sitting in hell. I'm hanging out. My teammates are all playing great. I got to step it up. I'm not doing that good myself. You got to keep an eye on Theory, really, because sort of ask yourself, can this team perform well with him, uh, with bad stat- bad statistics. Is he an OBJ guy? Is he a team leader? Is he a strategy guy? Or is he just the guy that's holding TK back and someone that I would recommend a roster change for? I feel like if TK has a bad placing at this tournament, they're not going to change, or they're not allowed to change their roster. But Theory's one place where you got to keep an eye on him, see if he actually plays well, because I think he might have a better CWL New Orleans. But if he has a bad tournament again, he might be in Buzzo territory, where he poses a lot of questions about how much he's actually worth to a team. Now we're going to look at a fun little uh, list called the wild cards. So these are players that didn't show up on the carry list, and they didn't show up on the cost list, but they had a high percentage of carries or costs. So they were really back and forth between carrying and costing, and they were a big enigma, uh, you know, a big catalyst for whether their team was, (laughs) enigma is the wrong word, uh, whether their team was going to win or lose, you know, they were on the top or the bottom of the leaderboard a lot. They were back and forth. They were a big wild card. Bevels is a great example. 20% carry, 40% cost. You know, sometimes he's doing really well. Sometimes he's doing really poorly. It's kind of interesting to look at. Blastful, same thing. He's right in the middle. 30% carry, 30% cost. And for that ground zero roster, I mean, now he's moved on. I think he's on Enigma 6. Uh, it's going to be super important to see if Blastful can emerge and get better from CWL Dallas, or if he's still going to be sort of a back-and-forth wildcard player. Hockey from Epsilon, kind of hanging out there as a hybrid. He goes 29% carry, 29% cost. Classic from Envious, 17% carry, 29% cost. A lot of people point to Classic as the real defining factor of whether Envious can be a top four top six team or if they're going to be stuck in that eight to 12 range whether or not classic can step up saints on echo fox 25 percent carry 21 percent cost he was back and forth he had some good showings some ugly showings malls from team vitality the guy who played the bar every once in a while 20 percent carry 25 percent cost he was back and forth i think if you look at vitality whether they're one of those really bad teams that's on an open bracket level, or if they're one of those prime European teams, like the third or fourth best European team, I think a lot of whether they're, you know, a lot of whether they're considered there or, you know, open bracket depends on Malls' performance. And the last wild card is John. John had a 22% carry and a 22% cost. So John is someone interesting too. He did, he had a pretty good tournament as a sub. He gets some respect there, but he also had some ugly performances too. John is someone that was sort of up there, down there, 
And I think for LG to win CWL New Orleans, which they're one of the top five teams expected to win, for them to jump out and win, I need John to really emerge. John to play even better than he did at Dallas. Now we're going to look at some quiet tournaments, some people that were doing no costs carries. They were just like totally under the radar. Priesta, especially. 7% cost, 0% carry. Priesta was quiet, man. Decimate. AR uh, for Enigma 6 really did not stand out in a good or bad way. Sort of totally under the radar. Dave, Dave on Epsilon. I mean, we didn't hear about him the whole tournament. He was nothing special. He did have a couple carries, but other than that, Epsilon was kind of quiet. Hook especially. Hook is sort of was this big superstar young talent. He was supposed to be on Temp's level. And, of course, he's moving from Halo, so it might take him a couple tournaments to pick up speed. But he was super quiet. He had no carries. He was nothing special at CWL Dallas. Study for Ground Zero. Study probably, you know, but this is specifically Hardpoint. you got to keep in mind, some of these guys were shining in S&D or CTF. But Study and Hardpoint was nothing special. 10% carry, 10% cost. Joe on Red Reserve was super right down the middle, super average, quiet tournament, 10% carry, 10% cost. These are the guys that, you know, really had quiet tournaments. You just didn't hear much from them. You can't really say they were good or they were bad. It's just right in the middle. Now we're going to look at a cool little list of quietly impressive players. These guys didn't have a high carry percentage, but they did have a really high plus minus. So these are the top plus minuses. These are players that had really solid tournaments, really good tournaments, and I haven't given them enough credit yet. Silly stands out. He was 15% carry, 12% cost. He wasn't busy on the leaderboard, but he was so consistently good. Silly was putting up these positive performances over and over again. And you know what's a Incredible is right behind him on that list, Arcides. Arcides was quietly one of the best ARs this tournament. Of course, there's a lot of other ARs that were standing out, from Chino to Formal to Octane to Crim6, maybe even Rated. There's so many good ARs, but Arcides was quietly a really strong AR performance. Pristini, from a sub to have a 2.7. Uh, there on the plus minus average was huge for Pristini. Pristini was one of the top subs, and he wasn't carrying his team, but he was always putting in these solid performances. He was playing really well. And E United didn't have any standout KDs. They didn't have any big performances, but they had a really good placing. And you got to give it credit to Silly, Arcides, and Pristini all having really quietly good tournaments. And all this team together just has so much raw slaying power. It was really interesting to see in Hardpoint the way that their teamwork was just there on point. Uh, they were the top three on this list. Then we're going to go look at Bance. Bance from Splice was crucial. I mean, Splice got second place. We haven't talked about a lot of Splice players because there wasn't a lot of carrying. But Bance was big with the sub. Even though he had a 24% cost percentage, outside of those carries and costs, he was doing really well. I'm going to skip just to say Tommy as well. Tommy's another one of those top ARs. He had a great tournament. He was playing really well. He had a 29% carry percentage. Outside of the carries, he had a 2.4 plus minus. Tommy was really impressive. Slacked on LG, playing that hybrid, playing a little bit of that OBJ role. He was really good. Quietly impressive there from Slacked. And then Dens from Mindfreak. If you're going to wonder how Mindfreak pulled off that loser's bracket run on Sunday, a lot of it has to do with Dens. I haven't talked about him yet because Mindfreak was sort of about Buzzo and Fida being not so much. Dens had a 46% carry. Outside of those carries, he had a plus 2.2. He was so good. Dens, for some reason, emerged as a really good boots on the ground player. Right now, I'd have to say he was the best player on Mind Freak. Keep an eye on Dens. Now we're going to look at quietly disappointing. These guys might not have been costing their team a whole lot, but they had some big negative performances. A lot of these guys are subs as well. Because uh, there's a lot of subs that, you know, we already talked about how many different subs had poor performances, but there's even more players that were quietly disappointing. Felony really stands out. Felony had the 36% cost. He had a negative 5.5. This guy was just, he's totally lost his slaying power. I don't know if he's going to be able to get it back, but at Dallas, the guy had just no slaying capability. Bevel's right behind him. Bevel's was a big negative. General right behind him. I mean, look at General. 20% cost, negative 4.14. Guy was just quiet. You expect General to be uh, really above. You want him to at least be an above average slaying power. Maybe with the PPSH being stronger coming into New Orleans, General will bounce back. I think he actually will bounce back, but he had a bad performance. Joe from Red Reserve. Joe was sort of under the radar. We mentioned him earlier on the guys that were quiet. 
and he was pretty poor. He had a negative 3.5. You know, Joe did not have a lot of good performances uh, as a sub. Nova from Allegiance. We talked about Spoof. We talked about Mayhem. But ALG, obviously, they did. They went 0-4 uh, in pools, and it was also because Nova wasn't doing that good. He negative 3.3. Not so much from Nova. Josh, another big-time player on Red Reserve. Uh, Josh was not the most. 30% cost, negative 3.29. Kind of a quietly disappointing tournament from him as well. Ferocities, you know, the other player on ground zero had a negative three. Maybe in S&D, maybe in CTF, but in hard point, Ferocities was super under the radar. Just a quiet tournament, disappointing. Not stats that he should be happy with. And then there's a few more players here on this quietly disappointing list. Blastful right there after Ferocities. He did have a 30% carry and a 30% cost, so he had some performances where he was really standing out, tearing it up, but outside of that, he was kind of a negative. He just does not have that slaying power uh, that you need to be a top hardpoint team. Zayrox from Vitality, quietly disappointing as a hybrid, didn't have a good slaying margin there. Aches as well, quietly disappointing on a hybrid, 22% cost, negative 2.7. Aches just has had not a lot of good slaying performances at Dallas, and I don't know if this guy's just going to keep regressing or if he's going to you know, tear it up on boots. We thought he was going to tear it up on boots. He's really got to show it to us. Nathan, the AR on Epsilon, pretty disappointing for an AR. He did have some carries, but outside of that, he had a negative 2.5. Skump as well. Skump had a KD of like 1.01 or 1.00. And he had a 31% cost percentage. He had a negative 2.12. Uh, a lot of the Optic players were just, you know, Skump was sitting in hill going negative while the rest of the team was tearing it up. Skump had a really bad tournament. It's kind of interesting. we got to see if he repeats it uh, because definitely the whole King Skump uh, was not present at CWL Dallas. He was quietly disappointing. The last thing we're going to talk about before we wrap it up is just the new rosters. Echo Fox picks up Aqua. Uh, gets rid of Gunless. The question is, is Aqua enough? You know, Aqua's really good. But Facento Assault Saints. One of these guys is going to have to step it up and slay with Aqua. There's somebody else gonna even have great turn is gonna need to have a great tournament for Echo Fox to play well in hardpoint. So the real question is, is Aqua enough to push this team over the edge? Rise Nation. Uh, they got Looney and TJ Holly. They pick up Gunless and Methods. The question is, can TJ and Gunless bounce back from Dallas and have a good tournament? Both these guys uh, they're going to hold Rise Nation back. I think if Rise Nation wants to break into that top four, maybe even win uh, CWL New Orleans, TJ Hawley's going to have to bust out and play really well, or at least above average, and same with Gunless. He's got to stop being a disappointment. He's got to bounce back from Dallas. That's key for Rise Nation. The new Ground Zero roster, they drop Blast and Pharaoh. They pick up Felony and Nagafin. The real question is, who else is going to be the AR with Parasite? Parasite has to play like one of the top ARs. He needs to be on that octane formal level for this team to do well. Because between Fellow, Naga, and Study, none of these guys are going to be matching uh, next to Parasite as a top AR. So this team really, uh, you're going to see them run one AR and three subs a lot, or the person who's running the AR with Parasite, they're going to need to perform. Uh, so that's the question with Ground Zeroes. Can Parasite really be a top AR? Uh, can he get some help? Home clan, Ricky, Bevels, Decimate, and Pharaoh. Pharaoh and Bevels are going to be running the subs here. And the real question is, you know, if this team wants to get out of open bracket and make some noise and qualify for the league, Pharaoh and Bevels need to be really good sub players. You know, the PPSH is back in the meta, really strong. I don't expect it to be a .9 KD like it was at Dallas. Pharaoh and Bevels are the key. These guys need to be tearing it up as subs. They need to take the pressure off Decimate and Ricky. And then lastly, Enigma 6, with General Dashi adding Sensor and Blastful. The real question is, who's going to help Dashi? That was the question last tournament. Blastful, bit of a wild card. You'd go either way. Sensor at a really low KD. I don't expect his KD to be above 1 at this tournament either. General, maybe he'll bounce back, but General had a negative one, had a under KD under 1 last tournament. Somebody's got to help Dashi for this team to do well. They've got the pro points. They're on the fringe of qualifying for the pro league. But if Dashi has another really good tournament, somebody's got to be right there next to him and slaying for this team to pick up those wins in hard point. Now, thank you for watching. Enjoy CWL New Orleans. This took a lot of time for me to put together, especially this video is super long. If you came all the way here, honestly, thank you for sticking with it. I hope I was able to provide a lot of content in spite of the formatting being weird, in spite of some weird mic problems I had. Uh, through it all, 
Uh, I hope you're able to enjoy this video and feel like you're super prepared, super knowledgeable about different players going into CWL New Orleans. I would like to do a, a video for Search and Destroy and CTF, but I'd have to sort of rush it, and it takes a lot of time, so I would only do it if I get really strong feedback. So if you want to see a S and d or CTF video right before CWL New Orleans, uh, drop some really positive feedback on this. So I'm inspired, motivated to do the next videos. But either way, thanks for watching, guys. Thank you so much.